Welcome, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, my name is Roz Cruz, and I work here at WICMA as an interim assistant curator of programs. And I'm really excited that we're able to participate in Claiming Williams today with a very special guest. And hi, everyone. Come on in. There's some chairs here, up there. Um, yes, so I'm going to just, you know, do a little land acknowledgement and then hand it off to our um, presenters today. So like I said, my name is Roz Cruz and before we begin, we respectfully acknowledge that Williams College stands on the ancestral homelands of the Stockbridge Muncie Mohicans, who are the indigenous peoples of the region, now called Williamstown. Following tremendous hardship after being forced from their valued homelands, they continued as a sovereign tribal nation in Wisconsin, which is where they reside today. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors, past and present, as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. Thank you for choosing to be part of Claiming Williams Day. The theme for today is justice and institutional power. This year's Claiming Williams invites all members of our community to consider for themselves how institutional powers, both at Williams and beyond, systemically intertwine to impinge on our identities and well being and re reinforce structural oppression and systemic racism. We ask you all to refrain from recording these sessions and we welcome your feedback on this and all the other Claiming Williams events today. Please note that we have posters at the entrance that lead to workshop evaluations. So please take the time, fill out one of those evaluations. Um, and again, we're so grateful you're here with us at WICMA today. Jordan? Thank you, Roz. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's super nice to have you all here. Thanks for uh, joining us in particular for Claiming Williams as so many great events are happening on campus. Um, for Claiming Williams, as we talk about institutional power, what a better place to talk about institutional power than a museum, right? Um, and what a better group of people to talk about institutional power with than the people I'm joined with here today. Um, so once again, I'm Jordan. I'm a Mellon Curatorial Fellow here at the museum. I'm also a grad student um, in grad art. And I'm joined here with Kim, who is a senior here, double major in poli sci and art history. And we bring our guest here, Dr. Kelly Morgan. So to talk more about her, um, She's a professor and the inaugural director of the Curatorial Studies at Tufts University, a curator, educator, and social justice activist. She specializes in American art and visual culture. Her scholarly commitment to the investigation of anti-blackness within those fields has demonstrated how traditional art history and museum practice work specifically to uphold white supremacy. Dr. Morgan has held the curatorial positions at the Indianapolis Museum of Art at Newfields, the Birmingham Museum of Art, and the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. Before her role at Tufts, she's had various positions where she's merged the classroom and museum gallery to create anti-racist paradigms for how curators can actively address the complexities of traditional art history, community engagement, and scholarly innovation. And as of November, Dr. Morgan is a recipient of the Emily Hall Tremaine Journalism Fellowship for Curators. Um, so with that introduction, I invite Dr. Morgan to talk to us about these museum streets, which we'll engage with today. Thank you. Jordan, thank you. Yeah. It's such a pleasure to be here to, with you today, and Kim as well, and all of you. Um, Jordan and I kind of go back <laughs> to my time um, in Indianapolis, and it's like you were saying earlier, right? It's like, what an interesting place, right, to talk about institutional power, right? <laughs> um, we, I started recently, it's, it's basically my website, and it's called These Museum Streets, um, and how that kind of came about was, I started out at the Birmingham Museum of Art um, working on American art, right, and working on constructions of blackness. And the more that I looked at historical American art, and I was like, you know, okay, so we're looking at the way American artists have, like, stereotyped blackness. In the process, they are also constructing whiteness, right? That process of stereotyping blackness is a type of construction of whiteness. It's like, okay, so why, nobody, why is nobody talking about this? Second, 
um, I started to then personally experience and then also witness, right, class discrimination, racial discrimination, gender discrimination across the board um, from, from the Birmingham Museum of Art and then the, my two subsequent museums after that, right? So as I started to observe, like, what would I call it? You know, just the, the type of ways that museum leadership can move you know, in very oppressive and discriminatory ways. Um, the secrecy and the sort of like back room things, right, right that go on um, that are very unethical um, among trustees or collectors or donors or all these things. And it's not, you know, every museum director, right, or it's not every, you know, trustee with this stuff, you know, is happening. Um, and it's having very real effects, you know, on people. And I was like, oh, it's like a street code, you, you know, um, and for people who know me well, you know, know this about me. I'm from Detroit. I'm from the hood. Like, I don't necessarily, you know, find that a, to be a bad thing. I grew up, I came of age in the 80s at the height of the crack epidemic. Um, was not an easy time, you know, to kind of be a kid from the hood. But what we learned, like our teachers taught us a particular way and our parents taught us in a particular way and our communities held us in a particular way that I like to call back alley navigation. So it was how to get around, right? Being pulled you know, into situations that a kid really shouldn't be in, right? or even as a teenager. Um, and you got around the structure of the place you know, that you ne couldn't necessarily get out of because these were our neighborhoods. And so I started thinking like, hmm, how do I apply that? to moving through, you know, whiteness and this function and like all of its sorted functionalities within institutions. So to myself and just to friends and, you know, just different people I would talk to, you know, just having personal conversations, I would say all the time, like, shit is real out in these museum streets, right? And so fast forward to a year ago, I reconnected with a friend of mine in Detroit who's a graphic designer, filmmaker, and he was like, you need a website. And I was like, tell me something I don't know. Like, I don't have time, right? <laughs> like, there's too much stuff going on. Um, and he was like, remember when you used to always say, like, you know, shit is real out in these museum streets? And I said, yeah. He was like, that's what, that's what you should title the website. But then that should kind of be the brand that you build, which I'm also like, I'm not trying to build a brand. I'm just trying to help people survive these workplaces. But, um, but that's where that, like, came from. So... Also, from his recommendation, I started doing lives on Instagram with people to talk about, you know, what, ha what actually is happening, you know, in institutions that I think a lot of prominent people in the field don't necessarily talk about truthfully, truthfully um, or in certain cases, in certain institutions, don't actually talk about it at all, right? And, I, and again, I don't have like a team of people and all this kind of stuff, so I was doing it pretty regularly until like October. <laughs> And then other things in life and career kind of took shape, so I kind of stopped. So when um, Jordan called and was like, we should do this at Williams, I was like, great. Like, one, I would love to see you. I was like, but two, I haven't done it in like three months. So like, <laughs> so that actually like works um, so that I'll have it, you know, and I can show it later. So what are we talking about today specifically? So honestly, you know, again, whiteness, right, in the functionality, you know, of white institutions. Um, and how we navigate them as BIPOC um, people, you know, and even, you know, honestly, even just how white people, you know, navigate whiteness in institutions because they navigate it very differently. I always say white supremacy affects us all negatively differently, you know, so it just depends on where you are on the spectrum, you know, or I should say the taxonomy, right, because white supremacy really did produce this taxonomy from like white male human citizen you know, to black female savage, um, what's the word? Primitive, you know, that's a word you should never forget in a museum context, but, <laughs> but, um, but in there, and everybody else, right, falls in between, you know, those two poles. And so most people don't even know they're on the text, like on the spectrum. Um, some people don't even like to admit, you know, where they are on the spectrum because some people have positionality on the spectrum that, it, that really works for them in particular ways, right? Um, and so it's that, you know, that I wanted us to dig into, you know, particularly as you 
and Kim and you know your colleagues who are here today and even people who are watching if you're if you're emerging you know because something that I kept running into was you know emerging museum professionals who were coming out of you know really wonderful programs like this and then coming into the going into the institutions being like oh my god what is going on um and what happened you know where people are like you should call Kelly Morgan <laughs> <laughs> you know, or like you should reach out to Latanya Audrey um, because we were kind of the only people in the field, you know, four or five years ago who would talk honestly about, um, you know, more of the things that we'll get into, you know, through this conversation. So, yeah. So as emerging, um, I was thinking about this of the three of us are, we can think about emerging from three very different ways. I graduated in 2019. I still consider, I'm very much emerging still. Um, and Kim, as you're on your way to um, graduating here, that, that fear of, not to throw that out there on you, but. No, it's definitely <laughs> a fear. <laughs> or the anxiety of, of going into this field that's supposed to be so elite and so um, hard to get into. Um, having to do a bunch of internships to get into it. I, I wanted to speak about how our experience of emerging may have um, differed as we emerged at different times. Yes. Um, so once again, I'm Kim and I'm currently a second semester senior at Williams. Um, I've worked at a number of institutions. I've worked at the Whitney, I've worked at the Studio Museum, and I've worked at Wigma for give or take the last three years. Um, so I definitely am pretty well versed in like all the mainstream like high end fine art institutions in um, kind of the New York area. Um, I would say no one has ever prepared me for the job roles Nobody that does. I've assumed, and I would continue to say that despite the community I've grown, every job opportunity is like being thrown out into the left field. Um, you never know what kind of entity you're going to encounter in the workplace. You never know what type of um, methodology like your office space assumes until you're like really in that environment, and more often than than not, um, they assume kind of a thinking that's inherently anti-black. Um, and that's kind of hard to deal with. I'm very young and I wouldn't say I'm like very experienced in um, dealing with like how to um, counteract racism in the workplace, how to kind of make sure that the thinking that I'm learning in my classes are something that I share with people who are very much my elder. Um, so it's a very complex place. I wouldn't even like constitute myself as emergent. Like I'm still in undergrad. I think of myself as someone who is still very much a student and will be a student for the next like give or take like five to ten years. Um, but yeah, no, I think that's a great question and it's a question that I continue to grapple with every day. Whenever I'm looking at these job applications, I'm like, yeah, this is on a public site, but is this something that's actually garnered for me? Um, you guys are looking for someone with my qualifications, but not necessarily someone with my skin tone. Yeah. And um, more often than not, you'll be surprised. <laughs> um, people are very excited to see an emerging young black curator, um, but they're excited to see it without having the institutional support in place to hire me. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely like would love to hear more about like Jordan's experience, considering that like you are many years ahead of me in terms of like grad art and stuff like that so like kind of how have you navigated that yourself and yeah um i think i knew from a very early age when i was interested in art that i had to work hard to get i don't know work twice as hard to get just as far is the model or something along the lines like that and it's interesting we, we were talking early about um when unpaid work was a big thing and i took a lot of unpaid work um, with the help of my school, but it was just a, like, you have to take unpaid work to get anywhere um, when I first started out. And I'm glad that's not the case anymore. There's a lot of, a lot of people understand if it's not funded, don't, don't go. Do I mean, that's the case with like a lot of programs too across the board. But um, yeah, I just, I feel like I just had to know to work hard. My, I had my first art job at 16 because I knew that I had to just rack up experience and whatever had like a museum attached to it, I, I have to take it. Um, and which it paid off, sure. Um, trying to think what else. Um, I, so there's a, because now, as you're saying, like they're looking for your requirements, but they're not necessarily looking for your skin tone. 
I would challenge that because I think it's pretty big yeah, to we be. Kinda right yeah, we're we're kind of hot right now. Yeah, we're kind of hot. <laughs> <laughs> um, everyone's looking for this diverse pool, right? And so, like you're saying, you, you are, but do you have the structure to support it? And, yeah. and that's what I'm looking at right now. And I'm, I'm thankful for the positions I've been in, um, but a lot of the positions I've been in have been made for marginalized groups who aren't as represented. And I want to prove now that I can get a job without being this marginalized group. Like, I'm just good at this. I don't have to be in this particular category or funded by this particular person to be here, too. So mm -hmm. that's the complexity that I'm kind of battling with right now. Yeah, I would honestly agree with you in terms of, like, being a black artist is very hot right now, um, especially, like, in all the major cities. Like, everyone that you see, like, emerging in the art world is probably most likely a very young, like, 20 year old person black color. person mm -hmm. um and it's funny that like you recognize that and then you're also hearing so many narratives of artists being like oh yeah my work um i donated my work to some place um or my work was acquired by someone and they only paid a fraction of the price or you're getting paid like 50k while someone who's doing half the work than you but is white is getting paid 80k mm -hmm. and stuff like that um and so to bring in that um, pop culture aspect of these museum streets. Can we talk about the, the Whitney situation that we, we discussed um, with them acquiring? Was that, oh, yeah, yes. the prints. Can you, can you explain that yeah. for the audience real quick? So, I don't remember, how long ago was that now? 2020? You guys yeah. may remember this. It um, was right after George Floyd. Right yes. after George Floyd. So there was a group you know, of BIPOC artists that had created prints specifically to like raise funds. Um, and the Whitney acquired the work, <laughs> um, which was not necessarily the point right of the work and so the the artist pushed back you know and uh, many pulled their works like from the show because it was they typically went like institutions do right they typically went about it as they would do any other exhibition um and not necessarily understanding um because i think the colonial design doesn't allow right that type of understanding that that's not really what this work is created for um it's actually created to act, to help people sort of you know um sort of further this, you know, this movement. Um, and there were, you know, several artists, you know, who pushed back and, and pulled their work, you know, from the show. And it was like all of this sort of backtracking, you know, on the Whitney, I think on the curator's part, um, more so than the institution's leadership. Um, but the, the, the curator, you know, just kind of not getting, <laughs> you know, like why the artist would do this, right? Because the idea is from a colonial mind is, um, visibility right you know you're gonna you know these are artists who have never necessarily had this kind of visibility before like you know i've never been shown in this context before um and it's like there's more than just whitney or like art contemporary art world context right <laughs> like people have other lives like there are other ways of knowing right as we like to say um and so that's always you know important it was like you know artists really taking their own agency right and taking their own autonomy um and taking power right away from you know one of the most quote unquote right important um, new york institutions um you know something about me is i'm, I'm very anti-establishment <laughs> so i'm very anti the new york institutions i'm very anti art history um or like the modern art you know traditional modern art narrative um primarily because i'm trained in black studies you know i'm not trained in art history um and and so for me you know the art history the art history the art historical narrative, um, you know, art museum, the art market structure has always been incorrect, right? It has always been problematic. Um, and so I kind of cherry pick what's necessary. And I always say, like, if, if the work or the structure doesn't allow for me to do what I'm trying to do, then, they, then the rules don't apply to me. Right? And I create my own rules. Um, and so that's the thing, you know, that I would, you know, just advise the two of you, right? And like and anybody else, right, who's listening. Um, I always have two rules. You have to know your why. So you have to know why you're doing it. Um, what is it that you're trying to get accomplished? What do you stand for? What, like, is this even the proper institution or the proper way to go about, you know, what it is that you're trying to do? Um, and then my other thing is like, make your list of non-negotiables. You know, what are the things that you can't live without? You know, what are the things that have to be there? Um, what are the things that you feel like you can compromise on if it is there? Um, when you're interviewing for things, talk to people who are not in leadership, who are not on the search committee, that work for the institution. You know, and I mean, now, 
people kind of know, right, the reality of what we're dealing with in the field. So people are more, you know, more prone to talk to you. Um, but those are the two things that you have to go in. I tell my students all the time, like you have to know what you're doing and why you want to do it, right? Because the unethical, the immoral thing <laughs> is going to inevitably happen. Um, there are going to be moments where you're expected to, to either participate in it, right, or be witness to it. Um, and you have to be able to say no. You know, you have to be confident enough, you know, to, to say no to your director, right? <laughs> or to say no to your chief curator, um, or even just a senior, you know, staff member, um, or to say no in a way that, like, because you may have to protect yourself or defend yourself from something, right? Um, so you really have to have a, 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 a really good kind of core, um, you know, in yourself. So much of this, you know, is about knowing who you are, you know, for you. You know, nobody else, right? Um, and that goes, I mean, and that's from white women, right? You know, down to BIPOC, you know, um, front facing, you know, our, our entry level staff. Um, we really, really do. And it's like until we really do that collectively, um, we're always going to be, you know, because these structures aren't going anywhere, right, anytime soon. Can I ask you a question? You mentioned that you are coming to the field via a black studies degree and specialization and as we're talking about barriers to the field what what bigger barrier than having to be an art history um art major to to get any type of uh, position for mm -hmm. the most part so how has it been coming to the field from an outside degree what advice do you have for people who r discovered this passion for art history mm -hmm. or museum spaces or inst art institutions um later than you know declaring their major in their like, mm -hmm. Um, bachelor's level. Yeah. I mean, it's like, I see a six in one hand, like half a dozen in the other, right? Because for one, it's like you, you're not beholden to it, you know, which is kind of cool, right? So when people are like, okay, so for instance, I just got this Emily Tremaine Fellowship, right? My articles, you know, come out this month and I needed image permissions. So, you know, the permissions that I asked for from Harvard, I didn't get. Right, um, because I'm writing in a black studies framework, and they're like, "Well, you're not talking about Copley, actually, right?" <laughs> so in that regard, it's like, because I'm an Americanist too, so this is the other thing that I kind of left out. Um, I always say I kind of get pulled into contemporary art kicking and screaming. I gotta stop saying that now because I've done way too much contemporary stuff now. But um, but my specialty is actually colonial period and, and antebellum, you know, American visual culture. So you know, j you know. Um, John Singleton Copley, Thomas Sully, Gilbert Stewart, like, you know, colonial decorative, art, American colonial decorative art is kind of like my thing. Um, and so it's hard, right, not being an art historian because traditional American art history doesn't read my work as art history, right? So I, did, I don't get the images that I need when I need them. Um, but on the other hand, you know, there's a way that like, when those things kind of rear their head in other ways, I can be like, oh yeah, no, that's not what I'm doing. You know, so, meh. <laughs> and it doesn't, you know, I don't struggle in the same way that I would say some of my colleagues who are like, who came out of art history, you know, do. Um, I don't have an issue with pushing back, you know, against the field um, in ways that some of my, my colleagues who were trained traditionally in traditional art history do. Yeah. I actually find that really interesting because um, I'm also a minor in Africana studies and I, feel safe saying that I have learned much more about black contemporary art in the Africana studies department than I have in the art history department here. Um, and I say that knowing that there's not a single black faculty member um, in that department that's actually um, like, is an actual art historian. Like they're learning alongside me and I've still found those conversations to be more fruitful. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I agree with you in the sense that like when you tell people you're doing Africana studies or black studies, more often than not, they think of it as like a deeply historical thing. They don't think of it as a conversation of aesthetics or they yeah. um, take it from a conversation, um, they take it from a perspective of the other side where you're talking about black studies and all they can really think about is black aesthetics. And that, those are the two um, kind of frameworks I've been working with. But yeah, I completely agree with you in that sense. Um, I think well, obviously the college and most institutions need to start recognizing black studies as being as interdisciplinary as it is. Oh, yeah. I have been vouching for many years now um, 
the Africana department having like an on-site like black artist. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think the college has really ever found a need for it, considering that like there aren't that many black art historians <laughs> here. But um, yeah, yeah I, I do think we need to start reconsidering the spaces through which um, people are allowed access through art. Um, many people do believe like, hey, if you're an art history major here, you're going to learn what you need to learn. But that's honestly not really the truth. Like sometimes, um, like many institutions, some departments aren't capable of teaching um, what you're interested yes. in. Yeah. And that's not really, um, I say that knowing that like somewhere out there an administrator is hearing me and saying, oh, another student is like talking about the failings of the college or whatever. <laughs> um, but and no, but it's uh, like very true. I think um, it's very surprising that we're very hell bent on like a liberal arts curriculum here, but fail to acknowledge the fact that um, certain studies are capable of doing more than the framework we position them in. And um, yeah. yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that was one of the reasons why I went the black studies route, right? Because it was like, okay, art history is like super behind the curve when it comes to black, you know, visual culture. Um, and then, but then black studies was necess didn't necessarily like, it's, it's music and literature, right? Or like politics and history too. And then it was like kind of either or, like these two tracks. Um, but the visual art was missing in a way. So I was like, oh, there's a space, right? So then it was like, well, who's kind of doing this? And it's like, well, Deb Willis kind of does this, right? <laughs> in photography. Um, and then, like you said, thinking about the other like black art historians, you know, who were like my icons, so like Rick Powell, Lisa Farrington, um, and having them say, "I see it," you know, and are like, "I kind of know what you're trying to do. You're never going to be able to do that in our history," <laughs> you know. But then having my black studies faculty at UMass go, "We have no idea what you're trying to do, but if you can figure it out, we support you," right? <laughs> you know. So I was like, okay. So a lot, so much of it was like being the into like having to step into those interdisciplinary shoes myself, and I had to build it. So we were you know talking about this last night too, where there's like people think there's this path, <laughs> you know, and it's like no, you really have to create it, you know, for yourself. Um, it doesn't just sort of it's not a, like a, a, a box check kind of list thing, you know, where it's like you get the degree, you get the job, you know, and then you get the acquisition, right, or you do the great exhibition. Because um, like you're saying, Kim, it's like sometimes you're working in frameworks that the institutions, that sometimes your colleagues, sometimes your, you know, your senior colleagues have no idea. Um, sometimes the scholarship isn't there. Right? So a lot of times you also have to write it. <laughs> you know, so it starts off as an exhibition label. Then maybe it turns into a catalog essay, right? Or an article or, or other iterations, right? They, yeah, it just, it grows. Um, and I think, you know, we have this critical mass, you know, of, you know, black contemporary curators and black contemporary artists, but like we haven't scratched the surface, you know, of the work that needs to be done and the work that actually can, you know, be done as well. And so I think you're so right about that. You know, it's like we're, the disciplines themselves are so adamant about being the discipline um, that the barriers, right, in between the two are like still a problem. This is bringing up, um, can, can you speak more about how it's key to have if you're within an institution, it's key to have something outside of the institution as well. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Can yeah. you speak more about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because you can't, it's like institutions are not designed to love you, right? They are not designed to care for you. Um, so you do. We talk about like work-life balance and that kind of thing. Um, but it's like, do not give your whole self, right? to any institution, because that institution is not going to give its whole self back to you. Um, so for me, Teaching was always, you know, my other thing because museums were such toxic spaces <laughs> for me. Um, and I love students, you know, I'm very student centered, so I always taught. Um, one, you know, just being frank, it's a money thing. You know, museums do not pay a ton of money, right? So you go into six figure debt getting a PhD um, and entry level positions at assistant curator, at the assistant curator level, maybe 55. 
right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, um, and you're probably going to have to negotiate for that, right? Um, and so teaching was always like my extra money, you know, too. And when things got thick, you know, so when, you know, again, like there's something really bad happening to me, um, or I'm up trying to avoid, right, the meeting that I really don't want to go to because I know the, re the really racist donor that's problematic is going to be at this meeting. I could always say, oh, I have to teach. Oh, I can't make it. I got to meet with a student. You know, um, so it also gave me this out, right, without, necess without my, <laughs> my supervisors necessarily knowing that it was like, no, I'm just not coming to that meeting. Now I just go, no, I'm not coming. Right, right, because it's like I've gotten more confident. Um, but starting out, like as a fellow, you know, I would, I had my classes because it, it was like my safe space, you know. Um, and it was also um, other, like another income, like another stream of income too, you know, because we're not coming from privileged backgrounds anymore. You know, if it, people, like if you know about the history of like curatorial positions, right, or just the history of museums, right, so collections, you know, let's just say, you have one major collector, right, donates, you know, his collection. The, the, that collection then becomes the institution. Um, and then the curators were typically family members, right, grandson, nephew, son. Um, it was about connoisseurship, you know, and, like, just who knew the collection. Um, so the salary wasn't necessarily necessary. <laughs> um, and then the field changed. You know, I always say, that there was no plan B, you know, in the art museum world, like there was no sense that the money would run out, right? Um, and technically the money hasn't run out. What happened was philanthropy, the culture of philanthropy changed. Um, there was no sense that culture on a broader level, right, would change in a way that would then force institutions to change. Um, and they've been able, you know, to ride out, you know, the waves. There was a wave in the late 70s, there was a wave in the 90s, right? There was a wave in um, like the mid, you know, like two, I don't even, what are we calling them? The aughts? I don't even know what that, what's that word for like the 2010s? Oh, the 2010s. Okay. <laughs> you know, so there was that. And then now here is like the next one. Um, so I could say like me and my constituents in, in 2020 were like, okay, let me, let's see how long this one's going to go. We're going to see how long we're going to make it. Right. And it's been two years, right? It's crest, you know, and where, you know, again, like white folks at different levels can just go, okay, yep, yeah, on to like the next thing. We're not allowed that, you know, privilege to just walk away. Um, you know, you see it with the, you know, brutal murder, you know, of, of Tyree Nichols, right, you know, last week. Um, and so we do all this work, right, work <laughs> from 2020. And then you literally have people on national television talking about, well, how is it white supremacy? Because the cops were black. And it's like, and back to zero. Right, like this is why, you know, you know we just do the work um, because we as a country don't have nuanced understandings, right, of what white supremacy actually is. Um, and like the ability, going back to what you were saying, Kim, about, you know, the interdisciplinarity between all the disciplines, like we ain't got time. <laughs> we ain't time to go back and like do all of that work. Um, but those are the things that I think, you know, we are really, the, or I should say that the art museum like field is kind of facing, that it can no longer just stick its head in its money, right? And be like, oh, it'll go away. It's like, no, this is not going away. Like I really thought it was gonna happen when the monuments were coming down. I was like, when people start realizing that these institutions themselves are monuments too, and I was like, and I know, like, being a curator at several different institutions ain't no contingency plan. <laughs> you know, there is nothing in the strategic plan planning for people running up in here, knocking vitrines over, right? <laughs> right? So I was like, if that happens, ooh, you know, that should be fascinating. Um, but then it didn't quite, like, it didn't quite translate into that. But it did start translating into, like, okay, so what's happening at the Natural History Museum? That's even making me think about, um, all the painting vandalization. Yes. Yeah. Um, and soup. how the, all, the soup, soup <laughs> gate, um, and how that really sparked the, 
put up alarms in people's heads of what's happening here, what's wrong, mm -hmm. um, and just also how quickly institutions restored. Like the paintings were never harmed yet. Um, that was the point of controversy and not the climate change that the protesters were addressing mm -hmm. too. So yeah, that backup plan of what happens when people start to protest in here and start to you know yeah. touch things that people have gate kept for so long yeah. and were untouchable at one point in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean seriously, I, they, I, like I, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I don't know. Uh, maybe your director has a better like answer for that, right? Because I'm like, I don't know, like what directors are saying, you know, about those things. And we, I was talking to somebody a couple weeks ago about um the, how the National Gallery is handling that, and they have armed guards, right? And it was like, did you know that there were armed guards? I was like, I did not know. It goes <laughs> back to you know the white supremacy part of it, right? Yeah. You know, and um, cause so where it shifted, like you're saying, Jordan, from kind of like social, right, protests and unrest to then being like, okay, now we have to guard um, the actual works, you know. And some sometimes I say to myself, even as somebody who like loves art, right, and like technically like loves museums too, and it's just like, so what happens? Like, okay, so we lose the one of a million Gilbert Stewart you know, portraits of George Washington. Do, like, does somebody, like, does it die? Like, does somebody die somewhere? Like, <laughs> like you know, that kind of like if a tree falls, right, in the forest, if nobody's there, do you hear? Like, who, like, who cares? Um, you know, I used to say all the time that between, <laughs> just between Gilbert Stewart and Charles Wilson Peel, like, we got enough images <laughs> of George Washington that allows us, like, five more generations. Um, but you think about, What's at Mount Vernon? What's in every library in every country? I mean, in every state, right? In every city. Um, and you can say that about Lincoln. You can say that about Thomas Jefferson, right? Um, you know, you can say that about a, a lot of, you know, different sort of like great white men. Um, so it's like, what are we really protecting? You know, so when you actually then say, you know, it's white patriarchal, you know, supremacist capitalism, you know, then everybody's like, oh, <laughs> you know, oh, because um, because nobody wants to address it, right? And it's in its terms, in its structural form. Um, I'm really interested in kind of that concept of protection you were bringing up, especially in relation to um the events of 2020 and kind of like that moment of like upheaval, racial awareness for the art sector that I'm pretty sure like everyone in this room witnessed <laughs> to some degree. And I just kind of want to know what your experience was with that. Um, what are your thoughts? And I mean, I don't want to say thoughts as if it's past tense because this is just like our lived experience every day in this sector. Um, but I think it's interesting. That was a time period when I was first like grappling with my love for art history and kind of grappling with, oh, this is an industry I'm considering for my future. So to kind of see that and then see the simultaneous like response to um, the murder, like just the murders of um, multiple um, black people over the summer and like the in mass protesting followed by moments of like institutional awareness and development. Mm -hmm. um, institutions were all changing like um, their mission statements yeah. and releasing letters oh and just like yeah. what <laughs> what was your take on that. I, I still have no words for that point in time, and I, I hate to say this, but I fear like that point in time is going to make a resurgence among particularly mm -hmm. the white community. Um, I don't think as black people, like we ever stop being aware yeah, of no. the violence in these institutions, the violence that we face every day, especially mm -hmm. in areas like the Berkshires. Mm -hmm. um, but like, yeah, what was your experience with that? How was it? educating people um, during a moment in time when you're looking at a sector that like you've kind of committed a lot of your work to and you're just like what is happening <laughs> yeah that was totally my response to him I was just like oh my god um, so that was a really tough time for me because I was also in the midst of like my own fight with my own director <laughs> um, um, or the director I was working for you know at the time um, but I've been down this hole in the last like maybe three years. Like I've been down this rabbit hole of the ins museums being, particularly art museums, being colonial institutions. So it was it was fascinating because my my colleagues and I the year before had done all of this work, 
um, you know, in the communities, like with all types of people. And we were really shifting the demographics of the institution. So our senior leadership, you know, then like, you know, one by one kind of started to pick us off, right? <laughs> and like force us into resignation. So behind closed doors, you know, people are like, okay, you know, it's, it's happening, Kelly, like he's gonna kind of come for you. Like I was number six, either number six or number seven. That's terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and they were like, you gotta say something. You know, you can't, like, you can't go and not say something. And I was just like, okay. Like, I gotta wrap my head around that, right? <laughs> Not that I didn't want to, because I had been standing up to him, you know, behind closed doors forever. So the murder happens, the protests are happening in Indianapolis. I lived downtown Indianapolis, right? So long story short, you know, protests are happening for a week. I forget what day, of the, like what, which day it was, like it was like day two, day three, but the, the police tear gas right, the protesters. So all of that tear gas is coming in, right, to my apartment. Um, so I'm just kind of all over the place because it's COVID, <laughs> right, as well. So he calls me and he's like, oh, you know, I just wanted to be, you know, I just wanted to make sure that you were okay. And I was like, no, you didn't. You know, but I was like, because we just had a whole fallout, right, <laughs> right? Um, two weeks ago, you know, about, actually, you know, kind of putting your money where your mouth is, like in dedicating this, or allowing this program in that's focused on BIPOC communities to continue. Week goes by, they put up, you know, the solidarity statement, right? Didn't ask the black artist Samuel Levi Jones whose work that they use, right? So, you know, Sam is upset, reaches out, so then he and I get into this, uh, this other like kind of like yelling match over email. Um, so I'm like, so where did all that concern go, you know, with the whole tear gas thing? Um, it's like they can turn it on and turn it off, you know, and it's like there's no connection. It's not all of them, but, you know, there was like really no real connection that like all of those things, right, were happening at the same time to me, right? <laughs> right? Um, and so, in hindsight, you know, as I, like, I, so I resigned publicly, that blows up in the media like it does. Um, and I was thinking about it, and I was like, you know, part of this has to do with the fact that whenever institutions, particularly art museums, try to address these issues, they do so through, like, the quintessential colonial practice. And it's putting BIPOC people in their things or cultural production on display. So the solidarity statements, Aren't, nest, aren't literal, right, statements of solidarity. Like you said, we know that as people of color, but in their minds, the virtue signaling is the work. So I don't actually have to do real work with real people of color on the ground because I own work by people of color. So I can extract that identity and project it, right, as, as my meaning institution. Um, this sort of idea of social awareness, right? To like, again, to appear as something. So it's literally like dawning black identity. Um, so an example of that is like, you know, Glenn Ligon then confronting the Met and saying, if you're gonna do it, right? <laughs> right? At least ask my permission. And if you mess it up, at least apologize. Um, so it was that where I was like, ah, like the institutions haven't actually figured out that acquisition and exhibition is not enough. However, as colonial institutions, it is the only thing they've ever known how to do because it is the only thing they have ever done. You know, so I was like, can we get there, right? <laughs> can we just get there? Um, and so you hear that, that narrative all the time. We just need to buy more work. And it's like, we've been buying work now for 35 years. You know, we just need to do more shows. We've been doing more, we've been doing shows for 40 years. Clearly, the problem is not the programming. Not that we couldn't use more BIPOC programming, right? You know, a better programming, but it's like there, we have to address the issue at the root. Um, and so it's like, I, that's what I'm trying to do with my program at Tufts. It's like actually retrain people and how to do the real work. I hate to cut our conversation off, but I'll say I'd rather extend it to the audience um, in our last few minutes. If anyone has any questions or comments, please, um, and Ross will pass the mic around. Thank you, Ross. Thank you, Dr. Morgan, and thank you, Jordan and Kim, for making space for this conversation. It's so important for us to have these conversations openly and candidly. 
Um, Dr. Morgan, you mentioned that um, these paths, to use your language, don't exist in a cookie cutter form and that it's important for us to to chart these paths mm -hmm. ourselves. Um, there are a number of students in this room who are really early in their careers within institutions and as academics and as uh, prospective curators. Can you give us some examples of what charting a path in the field looks like and what some of your experiences have been to that extent? Yeah, so for me, like I said, it was about um, interrogating whiteness, you know, and like how whiteness is constructed, you know, through historical American art and then how whiteness then carries itself out or like begets itself in institutions. So the first thing I did, <laughs> um, I, when I got to PAFA, because I worked, so I went from the Birmingham Museum of Art where I kind of got the idea. I was working with um, Graham Betcher, who was actually, he was a curator of American art then. He's the director now. And he was like, what you're doing, you know, the field really needs, so keep at it. But I didn't realize that the, like that support was only there, right? <laughs> you know, so Graham and many of my other colleagues at, at Birmingham. So when I got to PAFA, I was like, okay, I need a collection of major, right, you know, old kind of white dude, American art. And I, I started, I forgot, I used, I, there was a name for it, because like I said, it was programming, but I, I call them, you know, gallery interventions. Um, and I started doing, right, these, these critical race, basically like reads, you know, of like Benjamin West and like, you know, William Wetmore story. Um, and the field didn't, I'm sorry, the institution, like, didn't allow me to do the tours on days the museum was open. So, okay, so getting to Evans, like, the answer Evans' question. So I was like, okay, so you claim that this is about, you know, wanting the community to, like, learn, right? <laughs> but you don't, but you only want me to do these things when the museum is closed. So because I'm a black woman, because I'm a black woman from a lower economic background, when I go into institutions, particularly museums, I eschew, you know, the donor dinners, right, as much as I can. And I actually have dinner and like get to know the security staff and the facility staff, right? Because those are my folks. Right? Um, usually like that'll lead to like a church home or like it's how I find a barber, right? It's um and I figure out um, and build very genuine relationships, you know, with these with these individuals. So I had that at PAFA. So go to my friends at guest services, right? And I'm like, okay, y'all, I'm trying to do this thing. Um, they're not gonna let me do it in you know, the days that the museum is closed. But I got an idea. So I asked, like I said, I was teaching, right? So I told all of my students, I'm doing this thing on this particular day. Tell everybody you know <laughs> to come. And then I asked my friends at guest services, I was like, just let them in, because they're my students, right? Like whoever comes. Um, so the first one's like maybe 30 people, the second one was like maybe 60, like by the time I got to the fourth one, I was up to like 100 people. So administration is like, how the hell is she getting all these people, you know, <laughs> in these galleries? Because like, I'm clearly like, all of these people are not PAFA students. Clearly all these people are not her students. Um, <laughs> um, but that was like, that was what mattered to me, right? It was like doing the work that I knew from like other places, like being just the roles I played or just being a witness and being a part of other communities. People wanted to see at PAFA. Um, so I didn't care, right? <laughs> um, about what the administration wanted or not. And so I took that with me to new fields and then like expanded it. Um, so I became committed, you know, to my own work. And it's like, I call it the extra work, right? Cause you do, it's like, it took me a year when I got to new fields to actually build those relationships. Cause Indianapolis was a different place, right? So I wasn't just in because I was black. Matter of fact, I was out because I worked for the museum, right? <laughs> so I had to act like really get, like I had to dig in. Like I was tutoring kids and <laughs> you know, all kinds of stuff um, because they're, also, you know, BIPOC people have really great things going on in their own neighborhood. So I was like, well, where do you need me? What can I do for you? Like, this ain't about coming to an exhibition. Um, but, you know, you know, by the time the shit hit the fan, because I had made those relationships, he was forced to resign. I wasn't even in Indianapolis anymore, right, when that happened. But people knew that, like, 
it was like him sticking his foot in his mouth, right? <laughs> um, so the community rallied, you know, kind of around the work, right? Or like the path that I had left, you know, and they still do. Um, but it was, again, like kind of committing to what I wanted to do, you know, which was, a, which was really be in community with other people. You know, and that's what that path looked like for me. So it's like once I do that, so like coming to Tufts, like I'm actually kind of going back and forth with Tufts right now, right, <laughs> about some things. But um, it's like this is what I stand for. This is what I do. You either like it or you don't. And if you don't, that's fine. Doesn't mean I'm not going to do it. You know, you're probably going to be pissed off about it, right, <laughs> right. Um, or I will move on, you know, to like the next thing. But it's like I find the, I just kind of find those ways around, right. And so that's what you have to do. You know, you have to create the spaces um, for yourself, you know, in the best ways that you can for yourself. Yeah, and I just want to add on to that. I know I'm definitely like not as experienced in the sector, but the one thing I have learned during my time here is that um, in many ways, community building is the antithesis to white supremacy. Yes. Um, we're, we're in an environment that is very individualistic in nature. Like, as much as college is about um, joining clubs, doing groups, at the end of the day, it is your grade and your grade alone. And it, it's very much like a dog-eat-dog -dog world in Sawyer Library. Um, and, like, um, I definitely came here with that mentality in mind. I was like, I'm here to get my A. Um, if I'm in a group project, I'm going to do that for myself and like everyone else can sort out that thing. That was my mentality as a freshman. That cannot be further from my reality now. Um, I can safely say um, all the friends and community I've made during my time at Williams has pushed me be to become the individual I am, but has also pushed me to realize the fault in our system. Um, so yeah, like, I know a lot of people like coming from prestigious environments like this, it's very easy to go into the job force with the mentality that I have to get to the top and it doesn't matter who I kind of push over on my way there. But um, truly, I think community building is like one of the most radical things one can do. Um, and even though like I'm working in an undergrad area and like none of us like have jobs or salaries or anything and I mean the lucky ones who do like I'm like help a girl out but like <laughs> um yeah like th the intellect and just the pure joy I get from my community members is like much more than I think any institution can really grant me so I think everyone needs to be um more cognizant of that and be more open to just new people and being wrong because once you're wrong you can learn how to become right yeah. and i don't know i think that's something that like we should all instill in ourselves before post-grad life <laughs> yeah and i would add love to that too kim like you know that was another you know thing that kind of like made that indianapolis situation what it was because people knew me people knew that i loved them people knew that i cared about them people knew or I knew right, you know the people who loved and cared about me you know so regardless of how the institution responded you know it was like because it wasn't really about the institution right it was about us you know and that was actually kind of how that job description um wound up being written like that you know it was very purposeful because we as a staff as a as an arts community were a, were about each other you know, and everybody wasn't traditionally core and white, right, <laughs> right? And it was a lot of white folks, you know, who, I mean, it's Indianapolis, right? So there was a lot of white people, like, involved. Um, but it was like, we cared about each other, and the leadership just did not, like, could not and just did not understand that. Um, and so it's been fascinating, like, talking about love, right, in my classes, <laughs> you know, but not in, like, the kind of weird, you know, uh, commercialized, yeah, commodified kind of way. It's like, you have to care about people, you know? And I don't, like, if COVID didn't show us anything else, you know, it demonstrated that we cannot live alone anymore. We just cannot, you know, even the people who live with families, like you had that moment where you like, damn, I kind of don't like my kids, right? <laughs> because I don't, I only see you, what, three times, like maybe three hours a day during the week, you know, and then I have you on, you know, like maybe all day on the weekends, but that's like if we're not going to soccer or swim or basketball or whatever we're doing, you know, and it was just like, oh, I need to kind of reconfigure 
how I feel about stuff, you know, you know how I feel about people. Um, and so much of it, I think, is about that, like not to take away from objects, but we're such an object-centered field. Um, and the objects wouldn't exist without us. Without us, yeah. Hello, thank you for a great conversation. Um, I guess I have a question about the, your field. I mean, I'm, come, I'm, from, I'm an artist, but from a different field, a different medium, dance and performing arts. Mm -hmm. And so what has helped me survive white institutions is forming community outside of the institutions yes. with other artists um, and creating spaces where we can counsel each other and support each other. Yeah. And I wondered, are those tools available to the museum and curatorial studies? And like, are, is that there for you all? Have you all built that for yourself? Because I know for undergrads and graduate students, it has been a lifesaver in many situations mm -hmm. when they navigate these spaces. It's like we, I've done it. You know, I'm sure, you know, Kim and Jordan, I'm sure you guys have done it too. Um, but there's nothing that teaches you how, right? So I have a class that I'm teaching this summer called Curating as Community Organizing. Because um, in art history, right, or just even museum studies, like in traditional tracks, nobody tells you that part. Like people, you hear it all the time, like, oh, community building, you have to build community. But nobody give, even gives you, like, there are actually best practices in building community, right? Like community building, community engagement, and community outreach are three totally different things, right? <laughs> right? Um, and that was something that's really missing you know from the field itself um but it was like i was able to do it for myself because it's like that's what i care about so i just did it in the best ways that i could um but i've learned so much you know from my friends like you were saying right other curators other artists right who have been doing it their entire careers um have taught me a whole lot you know about um best the best ways to go about it yeah and i would I've, oh. I would definitely say that WICMA is very special in this regard where it is a campus museum, like students live right there. <laughs> um, so um, community building hasn't really been something that I struggled with considering that the community lives in proximity to the space. But um, I know that's not true for any, like most if not all museums outside of um, college environments such as this. But yeah, I would agree with you. No one told me how. Um, people usually are just like, yeah, like, look around, like, choose a person and talk to them, befriend them at a party or something. And it, it doesn't really count for, like, obviously, like, the social anxiety of the situation, but also just the fact that it's like, you could be building lifelong connections with these people, but you're not really given, like, the, the proper instructions on how to do it and stuff. So it really is, like, every, every step I take, I'm just like, figuring it out but I would say it goes back to kind of like an, a, a network of like a framework of love and empathy I think empathy is at the core of um, art studies even though many people don't regard it to be um, I do think there's no way to exist within this space without having empathy um, and I think once you grasp that for yourself and grasp like having your own personal love ethic, the community building comes very quickly. You just have to be able to determine for yourself, how can I support myself while supporting the people around me? And really quickly, I guess my, my question was about amongst each other, not just the community around the museums, but like amongst other curators and other professionals. And so how, because that's for me, I mean, I, of course I build community in my location, but it's talking to the sister across the country who's in an isolated department yes, 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 who yes. needs support and we support each other amongst professionals like i'm curious has that been something you guys have done as a field yes that's yeah fair. i would say that's honestly how i met kelly um i was in my senior year of college and i was the only art history major graduating that year and my project was on monuments and memorials right before that kind of was the aha moment for the rest of the country um and how that display demonstrates this, this lack of em empathy towards um, marginalized people across the United States. And I was doing this work and I was supported at DePaul, no doubt, like I, I felt like my advisors cared and um, thought my project was important, but it was heavy, it was heavy work to do alone at 21, 22, um, and this, as the only person in the department and, and to be this only like black queer person in the department too, um, that I met Kelly probably like a, a month prior to finishing and I just like, hey, can I call you? Um, I know you don't really know me like that, but like I think you can see 
my circumstance here. And, and so, yeah, just reaching out. And it, that question is making me think about the difference between networking and community building. Um, networking being this person has this title, this person is kind of where you want to be or along where you want to be, so you should know them. Versus like this person, it feels like they genuinely care for me and will write, write me a recommendation off of, you know, only knowing me for so little time and, and it feel a lot more genuine than we are trying to get in these certain parts of a, of a career. And if I like you, that's cool, but I'm really more interested in what you do. Yeah, I hope that answers it. Yes, yes, um, yes. I want to be, I want to acknowledge time and I know there's other events to get to. Um, on behalf of the Williams College Museum of Art, as well as Claiming Williams, thank you so much for coming. We'll be around uh, after this. <laughs>